today uh, we're going to talk about materials for high technology products and we have uh, two accomplished uh, IIT alum one from Bombay and one from uh, Madras and uh, you know they're going to walk us through this uh, the speaker today is Dr. Kaushik Vaidya uh, you know uh, did a lot of work uh, after his IIT Bombay stint in universities and in industry uh, across the world. Uh, and uh, he will be backed up uh, in many ways uh, by Professor Uden Ganguly, who's an IIT Madras alum, but now on the faculty of IIT Bombay. Uh, so both these gentlemen uh, have worked in industry for a long, long time. Uh, going forward next week, uh, you know, just for those who are already in, and I can see that we have 154 people already in. Uh, we have a, a session, a webinar on 5G technologies. And at the end of this month, on the 30th of May, we will be having one, uh, a completely offbeat topic is how to set up an IIT in a greenfield area. And that will be uh, Monday in Himachal Pradesh. So that also promises to be a very uh, novel topic. So, uh, uh, without much ado, I'll uh, hand it over to uh, Kaushik to take this uh, uh, webinar forward. Uh, so, over to you, Kaushik. Thank you, Ashok. And I also wanted to uh, thank Professor Mishra, Sushila, uh, as well as uh, Udayan for being here um, and, and all the participants. I know it's Saturday evening. Uh, thank you for spending your hour with me on a Saturday where you had options to be doing something else. So I hope I make it worth your time. And I also hope that it is uh, something that you learn uh, based on the collective experience that uh, we and Udyan have here. So as it says here in the title slide, uh, we are going to be talking about enabling high technology with material science. Um, this is my background and, and you know this is what I learned and this is what I've been doing for uh, last uh, couple of decades or maybe almost three decades now okay um, so if I can if you can take me to the next slide please yeah so I, I you know the agenda for this presentation is uh, I'm going to start with a little bit about me uh, my background uh, tell you what we are going to cover here uh, the, the third bullet is you know, material uh, science. Kaushik, your camera has turned the other way. Oops, sorry. How about now? Can you see me? No, it's back to no. One second. Yes. That's right. Can you see me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, so basically, as I was saying, you know, I, material science is like an ocean in terms of field. It's very interdisciplinary. And I'm going to give you just a very uh, top level view in 10 minutes of what material scientist uh, does or what is material science. Uh, this will then be followed by sort of like a case study of the work that I've been doing uh, in my professional career starting 1995. Uh, and then that we will cover two other topics, which is that of commercialization of the technology and the science, as well as volume manufacturing. Uh, I will end it with a couple of slides on what India should do as a country and what's going to be the main takeaway from this presentation. So if you can um, go to the next slide, please. Um, so just a little bit about me. So I, I was born and brought up in Mumbai. Um, for those who are familiar, I'm from a suburb called Villeparle. I studied there for the first 17 years and um, went to IIT Bombay, did uh, metallurgy for four years. Um, and then studied some more, um, currently settled in Bangalore. So the reason I did it this way is because uh, this is how you know, Willipali train station and all train stations are in Mumbai. And on the right, you see the, my home location on Google map. So just tell you how uh, technology has evolved. You know, people in those days in 60s and 70s were traveling by train and stations were the way to go. Now it's Google map. Just an example of how technology is impacting our life. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is a little bit on my education background. Um, as I mentioned, I did metallurgy for four years. Went to uh, Canada, studied at McMaster University, then uh, went to UC Santa Barbara. 
uh, for four years there. Um, and again, you know, they, they, in, in, in all the academic institutes, and I'm sure all the participants in Udyan will agree with me, it's not just the studies that we do in, in classroom. There's a lot of other learning opportunities. The learning opportunities are summarized in kind of the next slide. It's, it's making us a well-rounded human being. So this one, I'm sure um, those that study there are, are at IIT Bombay now would recognize this is what we would call it the pipeline road. The one behind uh, Hostel 3, Hostel 4. So, by the way, I was in Hostel 3 during those years and used to go jogging or running on that place. Um, in Canada, I started liking ice hockey. So, this is a guy named Wayne Gretzky and him lifting uh, Canada Cup in 1987, my first, my first year at McMaster. And then the last photo on the right is Santa Barbara. Um, again, I mean, what can I say? It's, it's uh, sunshine and the, the campus is right on the beach. Um, so that's just an intro about me and where have I been in my academic career. If you can uh, go to the next slide, please, I'll tell you what I have been doing since then. So since uh, you know, graduating in 1993, I did a two-year postdoc at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. Uh, following that, I, I worked at Applied Materials in Santa Clara, California for six years. Uh, came back to India in 2001. Worked at GE Research uh, for about a little over three years, worked for a startup called Bloom Energy, and then I rejoined Applied in late uh, 2005. And I've been with uh, Applied Materials since then. Uh, and our office is in Bangalore, and uh, starting our stint in GE, uh, we have been located in, uh, in Bangalore. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, just This next slide is just a very top level uh, view of what, what have I done in my professional career. So, for example, University of Minnesota, as a postdoc, I worked on coatings and interfaces. Um, during both the six years in Santa Clara Applied and last 14 and a half in Bangalore, I've been working on uh, developing semiconductor or semiconductor and solar cell manufacturing equipment. And the, you will see the connects that the equipment bring to the whole high technology and specifically on semiconductors during the rest of the presentation. Uh, GE and Bloom Energy, I worked on something called a solid oxide fuel cell. Uh, this is not exactly renewable, but it's, it's, uh, it's an electrochemical source of, of generating electricity. Okay, I'm not going to cover uh, solid oxide fuel cell in today's presentation. Uh, if I can go to the next slide, please. Uh, why are we here? Right? So we, we are here to understand what is high technology, what roles materials play in enabling their high technology, and then how, how do you commercialize something and what India can do. So I, you know, I thought, what's the best way to introduce the topic of high technology? Uh, and as you see, next slide, there's a bunch of uh, images. Uh, so first is all, all of us who are like tech nerds, high tech is like glitz and glamour for us. And every time a new gadget comes, every time a new device comes, we all want to know more about it. We all want to know the feature. We all want to know how it works. And as a father of a 21-year-old, I can tell you this generation uh, is very much into it and they are far ahead of uh, people in 40 plus age group. Okay. The, the other message I want to convey or communicate in this presentation is it may seem like a magic uh, that a mobile phone can do as much as it does, but it's not all magic. I'll, I'll show you just again some images on how it all comes together, and then give you know, end this section with uh, a sneak preview of what's enabling all this. Okay, so if you can go to the next slide, what I have is, as I said, bunch of images of what is high technology. So in the present parlance, it includes drones, it includes uh, electric cars, uh, which may be self-driving, it includes uh, foldable displays, it includes uh, a watch that acts like a health diagnostic tool. It also includes the image in the center, which is uh, an eye, and it's an eye that can help um, a person with high blood sugar uh, in, in ways that we cannot think. And then on the top right, you have a, a view of the smartphone with a cover remote. Okay, so in the present talk, I mean, all of these, all of these are high-tech products um, in the 21st century, but in the present talk, I'm going to focus on the top right, which is the smartphone. So if, if you can go to the next slide, um, what, what this is, is this is, if, if you take apart the latest Apple iPhone, which is your 
iPhone 11, you know, what do you see here, right? Um, on the left, I have what, what are all the chips. So you see those squares or rectangle pieces. Those are what we call as integrated circuits or chips. In the middle, the two black rectangles is the display. On the top right, you have the cameras and there's three of them. And on the bottom right, you have the battery. Okay, so this, this is all the, this is what makes up bulk of your iPhone in terms of the hardware. Um, you have the, the, the chips or the integrated circuit that does your calculation, stores your memory, helps you make phone calls, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then you have the display, which is, which is again, uh, pretty high tech, pretty fancy, both in terms of resolution and in terms of uh, being able to detect things just beyond the, what you see on the screen. And then you have pretty advanced cameras and the image quality is now controlled both by the hardware, which is the camera hardware as well as the software. And behind all of this is a, a powerful battery, which has again its own set of uh, material science enablers. So I'm not going to touch upon display or the battery or the camera, but for the purpose of this presentation, I will take you through uh, the bottom, uh, the middle and the left uh, portion of this slide, which is the uh, integrated circuit. So what we call as chips. Okay, so I wanted to communicate that it may seem like a magic, but when you tear it apart and put it back together, uh, there are discrete elements which make, which make iPhone or any other gadget uh, what it does. And in this particular presentation, we will be covering the memories or the logic, or the integrated circuits, which go into the heart of the iPhone. Uh, next slide, please. So if you see the, uh, no, I am just calling it what's behind the scene, and I, I will be spending a few minutes on this slide. Uh, so the, the square looking thing is, is what we call as microprocessor or, or, or the A13, which is the heart of the iPhone. Um, in the middle table, you will see here, it says Apple A13, and then it compares it to Apple A12, which is the previous generation. Right under that, it says uh, TSMC and 7 p So TSMC is uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation. This is their seven nanometer node. It again has the, the size of different uh, dies which are on this, uh, on this device. And then the table on the right, it just compares what are your uh, <clears throat> technology node, what's the chip size, and how many transistors are on this particular device. So if you see the second row, it says number of transistors, billion unit. So for a five, uh, five or seven nanometer node, uh, we're gonna have up to 10 billion transistors. Okay. Uh, and that should give you a sense of how, uh, how many transistors each chip has and, and you know, what, what's, the, uh, what's the size of each of those and what's the number of uh, dyes per wafer that we have. Okay. It also has other parameters such as uh, what's the uh, wafer uh, price and what's the die cost. Okay. And then what's the transistor cost per billion transistor. So this is not just technology or scaling or taking down to the nanometer dimension, there is also the economics of it. Okay, um, the, the economics is what kind of makes or breaks it, and you, you will cover this in the subsequent slides. But the messages I wanted to communicate through this slide is, we are truly uh, developing these products with nanometer scale precision, nanometer scale manufacturing. Uh, there are literally billions of transistors in, in, a, in a chip, and it, it um, the die cost itself uh, is coming down because we are putting down we are putting a lot of transistors per die. Okay, um, if you could go to the next slide, please. This is again for those that are not familiar with this field. Um, we call it a wafer. A wafer is what what it really is is a 300 millimeter uh, slice of silicon. It's a single crystal silicon, about one millimeter thick, and chips are fabricated on these wafers. And, and if you see the, the colored disc on the right, what it communicates is the, the repeat layer. So each one of this is a, is a chip. Okay. Um, and as I mentioned in the previous slide, we have about 10 billion transistors in each chip. So if, if, you, if, you, if you just think about it for a minute, uh, we are starting with a slice or a wafer, uh, which doesn't have any layers, any films, any coatings on top. And then after about 1800 process steps, we are converting it into a piece of silicon, which has these dyes, uh, 
which has these billions of transistors. Okay. Um, the, the cost to, to set up one of these factories, I will cover that in the subsequent portion. Uh, but this is what I do, this is what uh, my colleagues do at work, and this is what Professor Udyan does when he designs the, the circuits, when he designs these chips to make these, uh, to make these integrated circuits and, and to make these devices happen. So I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes giving you a very top level view of how it comes together. So we covered the, the gadgets, we covered high tech products, we covered smartphone as an example. We told you that there are uh, chips like A13. We also told you what, what's actually inside A13, how many transistors and what's the size of each of them. Now we're gonna tell you how, how each of these transistors are made at a very top level. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Yeah, so this is what I was saying. So the, the whole process of fabricating these chips involves very sophisticated material science. It involves uh, dozens of unit processes, it involves integration, it involves packaging, and it involves sophisticated characterization of each of these unit processes at nanometer level. Okay, so if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, you know, one of the ways you look at material science is you start with what you studied in chemistry. Um, right, during your school days and you say, okay, what's the foundation? Uh, what are the foundation? One of the ways of looking at the foundation is the periodic table. Uh, the other way to look at it is what are the different materials? There's something called as crystalline, something called as amorphous or glassy. And then the third element is how do you characterize, how do you make these things? Do you make this in bulk? Do you make this in thin films? And what's the role of nanotechnology? I, I briefly touched upon the fact that we are truly working at five nanometer and seven nanometer dimension. I'll show you what those dimensions are in a minute, just to set the context. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? <clears throat> so this is just maybe revisiting the college years. And I say this, but this is uh, your periodic table. Uh, what I would like to highlight are the elements on the right here, which says uh, silicon, which is element atomic number 14. You also have boron up there, phosphorus. So silicon is the semiconductor. Um, whose properties, mainly the electrical properties, can be changed in a controlled manner by doping it with small amounts, uh, parts per million or less, of uh, elements such as phosphorus or boron. Okay. Uh, there are other elements of periodic table which are of interest to material scientists, and we'll say, see that in the next slide. Okay. Yeah, if you can go to the next slide, please. So again, I'll go back to the, the smartphone example. Uh, so when you look at the smartphone, you have, uh, as I said here, you have your touch screen, you have your battery, and you have your electronics or chips and the casing. And what this slide shows here is what are all the elements involved. So for example, if you look at the electronics on here, uh, not only do we have your metals, which is your copper, silver, gold, tantalum, we also have a bunch of different radars which go into making a radar uh, chip. We have uh, the dopants, we have oxygen, we have the contact materials, which is tin, okay? So that's, that just tells you how, how much of knowledge and how much of experience is needed to make uh, the latest A13 or a, any other uh, chip that, that's required. In addition to that, you also have the screen, which has its own set of materials, your battery, which is nowadays lithium ion, and then you have the casing. Okay. Uh, you don't see any of this, nobody tells you what's inside the phone, but next time you you use your phone, uh, I hope you have a sense of appreciation of how much of uh, technology goes into uh, building a, a device like this. Okay, if you can go to the next slide, please. This is just a very, very top level uh, view of what, what is, what are materials. As I mentioned, there are two classes, mainly crystalline and amorphous. Um, it, it has to do with periodic arrangement of atoms or, or even molecules in some cases. That's the determinant or whether something is crystalline or amorphous. Uh, there are different class here as well. So you have metals, you have many classes, polymers, and each of these class, material class can, can be made amorphous or crystalline depending on how you process them. Uh, the, the other thing which I would like to bring up here is that the, the whole set of materials and their arrangements at the atom level is another foundation of material science, just as periodic table was. Uh, so if you can go to the next slide, you will see that this is, I, I'll not spend too much time on this, but this is how do you make materials, right? There is plethora of techniques and technologies. Uh, what I have shown here is 3D printing. 
uh, it kind of takes you back to Mission Impossible uh, movies, but people are uh, using 3D printing or additive manufacturing for doing something really, really unique uh, in several industries, and I'll leave it at that. Uh, if you can go to the uh, next slide, please. So this is, I, I'll sort of digress here for a minute. Um, this whole field of semiconductor or semiconductor manufacturing was envisioned um, about 60 or maybe more than 60 years ago by Professor Feynman, uh, while he was a professor of, he was a theoretical physicist at Caltech. Before that, he was at Cornell as well. And he had a seminal work done uh, in, in a paper published called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. Okay. And, and if you, I, I, mean, I would be happy to share this technical paper or semi technical paper with you. But his, his main uh, findings or his main uh, sort of look into the crystal ball where there is plenty of uh, room, as in being able to miniature, miniaturize, being able to move atoms, being able to arrange atoms. And believe it or not, in 60 years since he uh, published the paper, or 65 years since he did the work, uh, all of this is coming to fruition now. You will see in subsequent slides that we do manipulate atoms, we do work at one nanometer, three nanometer, five nanometer scale devices. Okay, so this is the, the message again here is in almost everything in high tech, uh, science leads and then technology follows. And then commercialization of the technology is where material science uh, plays a huge role. So if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, this one, you know, if people, those of you who are not familiar with what's a nanometer, uh, this is just a landscape. Uh, it, on, the, on the right side, it just says human, which are, you know, one, one and a half, maybe. 1.8 meter tall, about six feet. And as you go to the left, you see the size of the length scale is shrinking. Uh, you have 100 nanometer virus size. I know virus is on a lot of your mind, but uh, the dimensions that we are talking about is a lot smaller than the virus. It's even smaller than a DNA strand. DNA strand is about of the order of 10 nanometer. And, and when we talk about one nanometer, we are truly talking about molecules. Just as a reference, a typical size of an atom is about three angstrom. So when we talk about five nanometer, we are talking about between 15 and 17 atoms. And how do you how do you arrange them? How do you move them? How do you modify them? How do you pattern them? How do you uh, deposit or, or uh, selectively remove or etch them? And more importantly, how do you see them? I mean, we we do have some pretty sophisticated microscopes and other. Uh, technological tools to, to characterize these devices, and you will see that uh, in the next slide. So this is just, you know, I, I just call this as a nanotechnology timeline. So it, as I mentioned here, it, it all started uh, with Professor Feynman's lecture on uh, this plenty of uh, room at the bottom, which was in late 50s, 1960. And then Intel uh, started bringing, you know, bringing their chips uh, to market in early 70s. Uh, since then, there was work done on uh, uh, carbon. Yes, and this term nanotechnology was coined by uh, Professor Taniguchi at uh, Tokyo University. Uh, another big development was in the field of characterization where you know, scientists developed something called as an STM, which is scanning tunneling microscope. Uh, researchers at IBM use that. So if you see here in the timeline, 1989, they actually uh, spelled out this word IBM by positioning atoms using uh, a scanning tunneling microscope. Okay. Since then, there is like no looking back almost. You know, in 2005, uh, we had the first uh, microprocessor or a first chip which had a billion transistor. And in 15 years since, which we are today, 2020, we have uh, about upwards of 10 billion chips, or 10 billion transistors in one chip. Okay. So if you think in terms of time scale, if you think in terms of what it takes to design, what it takes to build, and what it takes to commercialize, it, it's, it is phenomenal that we have made the progress we have, and we continue to go down on that path. And you will see some of those roadmap items in the subsequent slide. Can we go to the next slide, please? So this is just, a, 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 you know, I will end it here with this portion and say that this is how thin films and materials come in. So this one is from a company called Global Foundries. And there's seven nanometer uh, integrated circuit process flow. So if you see the image, there are three words. First, it says F-E-O-L, then it says B-E-O-L, 
and then it says back end or advanced packaging. So FEOL is front end of the line. So this is where your transistor and the first layer of first level metal uh, connections are made. Then you have BEOL, which is your back end interconnect. And up now we have up to seven, nine levels of BEOL or interconnect. And at the end, you have a lead free solar bump. So, so if you look at again, the action or the movement of electrons in the funk working of the transistor happens at the FEOL level. This is where you truly have nanometer scale dimensions. After that, you go into the BOL where you basically take the electrons which are generated in the active or transistor region and you take it to the outside world. And in, in the bump or in this uh, packaging in area uh, is where you make connection to the outside world. So again, uh, this is kind of getting technical, but I, I just want to say that front end of the line and back end of the line is where most of the material science and the technological advancements are. Okay. Uh, next slide. So again, I, I will <clears throat> get into this. Uh, what, what is a memory cell? And I will also cover solar cell after a break. Uh, but I, I want to give you a glimpse of what's a memory cell, what's a transistor, and how the dimensions have been evolving. If you can uh, go to the next slide, please. So the original transistor, right, was was invented at Bell Labs, and these three gentlemen here. Uh, John Bardeen, uh, Bill Bra uh, Shockley, and Bratton. They got the Nobel Prize for this. This was a very clunky looking. This is their original germanium transistor. So germanium also happens to be a semiconductor material that can be doped and, and can use to amplify current under certain conditions. Um, but this, is, this was uh, late 40s, mid to late 40s. Uh, since then, the transistor has gotten planarized. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. This is again a very, very basic view of what a transistor does. Uh, it, like I said, it's nothing but a semiconductor device which can be used as a, for amplification or as a switch. The transistor in a lot of ways is responsible for the binary logic that we have here. <clears throat> One neat thing about the transistor in this particular case, where I'm showing you an example of what's known as a MOS transistor, which is metal oxide and a semiconductor transistor. If what you see here is a single crystal p-type substrate that is doped with phosphorus or n-type uh, dopant. Uh, you have the hash line which is your semiconductor, uh, which is your dielectric. In this case, it is silicon oxide which grows as a native. And then you put metals on it. What are, what are the challenges is how do you define the areas which are doped? How do you make sure that there is isolation between your NMOS and PMOS? How do you do your your circuitry such that you can pack as many transistors as possible. Okay, that's, that's where the technology and the creativity comes in. If you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, this is again, you know, I, I, this is maybe a little bit too detailed on how the transistor has evolved in the last 70 years. Uh, this is, we are in like 73rd year of transistor. Um, I, I can send these slides to you and you can study this in detail. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So this is this one is important because if you see here, this is your dimension that as I was talking about, right? On the x-axis is the timeline, on the y-axis is the typical size. And, and this is of course on the log scale. Okay, so the, the whole integrated circuit and, the, and the, the Intel 22 nanometer chip came maybe 15 years ago. But since then, this line is just continues to go down, right? And then we are at almost at single at, or we will be at single atom stage in about a decade from now, but we are dealing with anywhere between uh, say 14 and seven nanometer in volume production right now. Okay, so again, another illustration of how complicated these are getting and how much of uh, returns you get if you do it right. So okay, can we go to the next slide? Uh, this one again is something known as a Moore's law. This was sort of, sort of uh, predicted by Gordon Moore, who ended up being CEO of Intel. He started as an engineer. And this again is timeline and the number of transistors. So as I said, we shrink the size or the length dimension. We get these transistors into a three-dimensional structure. So from 2D to 3D is, is one of the changes that happened. There has been a lot of evolution in the materials we use, the designs we do. Uh, but I, I like this because it just graphically shows how uh, it evolved from PC to uh, to smartphone, now to medical, uh, your Apple Watch, and, and large data center. And, and everything is moving to SSD nowadays. So that's again 
uh, a, a challenge and, and an opportunity for us. Okay, so, so Moore's law is nothing but uh, uh, sort of a prediction based on his knowledge and, and his experience of how the number of dyes or the number of transistors will double almost 18 to 24 months. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? We will take a break pretty soon, but I wanted to give you a, another view of how the transistor has evolved from a planar to a three-dimensional silicon-based pinfet to what it will go into a one-atomic layer pinfet. Okay, so as you see here, from 1960s to 1990s to 2020, um, the, what has increased is the complexity in volume manufacturing. And as I referred to earlier, we have up to 1,800 processors for some of these uh, advanced pinfet where we do talk about dimensions going into nanometer, uh, say three to five to seven nanometer for the most critical dimension. Uh, can we go to the <clears throat> next slide, please? Same thing, how are we gonna do it? We call it technology node. Uh, how we enable this is, is something that our, uh, my employer applied materials and our customers, who you will see in a minute, uh, are working on. Uh, next slide, please. So, so this is again cross section of a couple of different chips. This one happens to be what we call as a <clears throat> NAND chip. Uh, just telling you how the structures are now stacking up from two dimensional to three dimensional. And these are all still done at nanometer landscape. Uh, next slide, please. So this is where you know I, I would take a break. Uh, it's about 5.35. I've been talking for close to 30 minutes. We did cover uh, high tech products. We did cover elements of the high tech product, which is a smartphone and the A13 chip. Uh, we did cover what goes into this A13 chip, how many transistors, and we did cover the role played by nanotechnology and materials. So as you take a break, uh, I will hand it over to Professor Gian Gambuli, and I want to sum summarize the three main takeaways for you to think about uh, in the next few minutes before we change gears and get into uh, another application. Odin? Hey Koshik, uh, so I think you're doing really well on time. Uh, so, and things look very interesting. So, uh, there were a couple of questions. Um, so, uh, one of them uh, was about particle sizes. So, a question was about uh, how to make very small particles. For example, uh, People, chemists can make about 100 nanometer particles with hydrothermal, uh, solvothermal processes. Mm -hmm. uh, but what would be methods to make particles at three to 10 nanometers? So I thought that this would be a good time for you to even sort of, uh, I mean, respond, right? Uh, yeah. In terms of what sort of control people have now in the semiconductor world. So sure. yeah. go ahead. There are a couple of things. So in, in you know in, in semiconductor world, especially when it comes to fabricating integrated circuits, particles are kind of dirty because you know we call it particle defection. We don't want them on the wafers on the substrate. But I see other applications for nanoparticles, right? And and we have been using, for example, there is something known as a core shell structure. So you have uh, a core which can be kind of sacrificial. Uh, and, and then on top of that, you do deposition, and then you remove the core selectively. So that's one way you can have your particles approaching nanometer. Uh, one of the process used for doing this is what we call an atomic layer deposition or ALD. Okay. ALD is also used to deposit coatings on particles of that landscape. And there are applications in not only in semiconductors, but in energy storage, as well as in pharmaceutical. Okay. So yes, uh, AD and, and some of the other hydrothermal synthesis is something you talked about. Uh, combustion synthesis is other for forming nano-sized particles. Yeah. So I, I also think that, you know, it's important to sort of highlight that um, particles are sort of a gross, uh, you know, unit of, of a material, right? Yes. But if you if you look at a semiconductor device like a transistor, uh, the gate lengths which are printed by control is about ten nanometers. Yes. Right. So mm -hmm. it is it is not only that you know people can make particles they can they can write small designs on the particles today. 
So, yeah. uh, of course, you know, I, I think there are ways to make these particles, as, as Poshik was saying. So I think we are, in terms of technology control, I think there are very lots of ways to do it. The question is, what is the application? And, you know, whether there is money in the application. So, uh, yeah, it's all about commercialization. And, and it, you, do, you, you, know, you, you do want to invest where there is significant return. Because all the, the investors and the company founders are spending a lot of time developing this technology, but if there's no commercialization or volume manufacturing, it's not going to see the light of the day. And often the research does end up like that. I mean, solid oxide fuel cell was one example where I spent four years of my life developing products, but it's just not going to be commercially viable right. on large, large scale. So, so one you know another comment that came in i think uh, you know we can take this before we resume uh, is that uh, there is this whole uh, thrust on materials recycling right yes that mm -hmm. that you know in, in the time of covid uh, when you know some of us who are lucky to have gardens we are trying yes. to compost and <laughs> make our gardens um, <laughs> You know, in the semiconductor world, there must be the need to recycle because materials are, of course, scarce. So I think it'll be a good question to address for this group. Yeah. So in the in the electronics industry, right? When you look at the semiconductor, uh, what we don't see is is like at the nanometer level, but there is plenty of metals like your copper, platinum, and at the very back end, even gold and silver. And there are companies who have uh, pretty benign uh, chemistries to strip and remove and recycle and reclaim at least some of the uh, transition and precious metals. Uh, what doesn't get so at the, that is number one. Number two, the whole industry is now moving away from lead. Uh, so whether you look at the back end soldering or, or you know any other uh, elements uh, that you need to join them at the gross level, uh, there is lead free solders now. Okay, so recycling, reclaim. And using it, uh, doing it uh, with chemistries which are not harmful to the environment, uh, it is sort of happening. But it, it a lot can be done because if you just look at the smartphone as an example, right? There are literally hundreds of millions of smartphones which are manufactured and, and sold every year. And the life of the useful life. I mean, we all sort of want the latest and greatest. So after two to three years, everyone upgrades their phone, and then what happens to the ones you, which you had already? A lot of the smartphone, if you tear it apart, uh, in addition to the plastic and screen, all the integrated circuits that, in, that are in there are uh, recycled and, and at least the materials, mainly the metallic elements, are reclaimed uh, for, for other applications. So good question, but, but there is need for being creative and developing chemistries which do a better job and do it more efficiently than what's being done now. Great. So Koshik, I think you know uh, this is a good segue to the next part of your talk, right? Yes. Yeah, uh, this is a good segue. So yeah. So maybe maybe I think you continue, and then we, towards the end we'll have another set of question answers. So there are some questions that have been posted that we have not uh, addressed, but uh, I think some of the questions uh, we will take up once uh, the talk is sort of done, and uh, you know there is more of a discussion. Sure. So you know one thing which uh, thanks to then. Uh, one thing which I, I did not cover is how much electricity is required. We all talk about uh, you know the latest and greatest. We all have the the population now that's using so social media. Um, there was some statistic which I read on how many uploads are there on YouTube or Instagram, and and you have to think, you have to imagine all of this data that's been generated is stored somewhere, right? And and it's stored in massive server farms, and those server farms need electricity. That's point number one. So the electricity demand as the, as the adoption of semiconductor or as the adoption of high-tech gadgets increases, the need for electricity is also increasing. That's point number one. Point number two, at the technical or technological level, there's a lot of heat generated in all of this. So, so the whole way of dissipating this heat, not only within a chip, but even within a server farm, it's going to take a lot of creativity, right? And number yes. three, uh, people, if you keep burning coal to generate electricity, uh, we will have the whole debate on global warming, uh, ozone layer getting uh, depleted, etc., etc. So last, uh, maybe it's, it's, it's a kind of a parallel development as the semiconductor 
integrated circuits and the gadgets using them increased. Um, last 10, 15 years have also seen a massive rise in renewable energy. The two main sources of renewable energy are wind energy and solar energy. So I thought, you know, as a continuation of this theme of semiconductor and specifically on silicon-based semiconductor, what else can we learn in, 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 in relay regarding the use of materials? Okay. So I am going to, if you can go to the next slide, I will give you a basic glimpse of solar cell. And specifically, I will cover crystalline silicon solar cells. So just as you have variety of different types of integrated circuits, some based on silicon, some based on uh, 3.5 or 2.6 compound semiconductor. Uh, solar cell also you have both organic and inorganic. Um, within the inorganic portion of solar cell, it is crystalline and thin film solar cell. There are six solar cells. There are a the whole range of technology and materials when it comes to solar cell. Uh, in terms of adoption, I would say about 95% of the solar cells and modules that are used in the world are based on the same exact crystal and silicon that is used to develop your integrated circuits and chips. So I'm going to again in next uh, 10 minutes or so, I'll cover the basics. I will tell you the same doping, the same boron and phosphorus that's used to make integrated circuit is also used to make solar cell. The same passivation and the silicon nitride layer in this case is used. And what is different is the metallization scheme. And as uh, Udayan and I were discussing, the metallization is far more complicated for an integrated circuit. But for a solar cell, it's at a very uh, mega or, or large dimension. And it's done using silver or silver aluminum alloys. I will touch upon that as well and we'll talk about integration. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, please. The, again, the genesis of, uh, there, was, there was one more, yeah, what, what happened to this slide? Oh, sorry. So the genesis of this is in what's known as photoelectric effect. And this was done by uh, Albert Einstein, right, who, who won a Nobel Prize for this in 1905. And what he observed was in, uh, this was in the element, uh, one of the alkali, uh, I think it was testing with potassium at that time, uh, where he, he, when you shine lights on metals above a certain wavelength uh, of light or above a certain frequency, it was emitting electrons. So that's that's how he coined this term photoelectric effect. Right? So you have photo or photon, um, which then generates electricity. So if you go to the next slide, um, I will show you what how this happens, right? So again, you have on the left, a crystalline silicon uh, solar cell, which is then you have this red squiggly thing, which is your photon striking it. Um, silicon, as you know, has a band gap of, it's an indirect band gap semiconductor with a band gap of 1.1 electron volts. So uh, in a certain range, it includes visible uh, spectrum as well. The silicon does generate uh, electricity uh, using photoelectric effect. And what you see here is on the right are two uh, squarish looking things. So the one and the black is what's called as a monocrystalline silicon solar sun. And the one, the bluish looking uh, square piece is what's called as a polycrystalline or multicrystalline solar cell. And the cross section view is, is what you what you see here is again, this again goes back to the same thing. You start with a bulk silicon, you deposit layers, you pattern layers, you form what's known as a, a P-doped and N-doped uh, junction. P-doped and N-doped region, you form a junction. On top, you form what's known as an arc layer, anti-reflection anti coating layer. And then you put the, the metal contact. So these lines that you see here, two lines on the left, three lines on the right, and then you have very fine lines under those. That's what's called as the metallization and, and the bus pass, okay. uh, grid lines and bus pass. So if you go to the next slide, please, I will show you how the whole system is, is kind of coming together. So some of you may have seen solar farms, uh, and these days even rooftop solar is picking up. But it all starts with a single 156 by 156 millimeter uh, slice of silicon. Uh, it can be single crystal or multi crystal, about half millimeter, and nowadays it's even getting thinner. Each uh, silicon solar cell generates about four watts, it depends on the technology and the efficiency, but between four to five watts. Uh, what they do is that, that amount of electricity is not enough for anything meaningful. So they combine these cells and form what's called as a module. So on the right, you have is rectangle which is combined they do a series and parallel connection of anything between 60 to 72 cells 
And each module these days generates about uh, 300 watts. And then you take these modules and you form what's known as a panel. And uh, people who have a rooftop solar cell uh, for generating uh, you know, electricity usage for their own residence have anywhere between uh, one to five kilowatt on the rooftop. Uh, in addition to that, there is also these solar farms, right, which go into hundreds of megawatts. So up to rooftop, it's okay. We, you can have your uh, one to three, maybe five kilowatt worth of solar panels. But when you are talking solar farms, where you're generating literally hundreds of megawatt, uh, you need much more than what, what just the panels have, right? So you need your isolator, you need your charge controller, battery inverter, right? And then eventually a lot of these farms feed electricity to the grid. So there's a whole infrastructure on that as well. And you know, the current government and uh, <clears throat> Mr. Modi, when he was chief minister of Gujarat, he was a big proponent of using solar electricity and, and that has definitely contributed to present scenario where the usage of coal-fired power plants is now in, in a place like Germany, it, a lot more renewables are used between solar and wind. But in India also, the, the share of renewables has increased significantly in the last uh, five years or so. So if you go to the next slide, I am just showing again the, the adoption. Uh, so this is again on the log scale on the y-axis, here on the x-axis. To total cumulative uh, solar installation, solar photovoltaic, and this is in gigawatt, which is you know, 10 to the power of nine. A gigawatt is a thousand megawatt. It's about 400 gigawatt. And again, if you see here, there are a variety of reasons. First is there is improvement in technology. There are uh, subsidies uh, which, may, which has made it affordable, uh, as well as this is now demonstrated beyond a shadow of doubt that if the panel or if the module is made right using quality materials and manufacturing processes, uh, this last easily can last 25 years with about 10% degradation in performance over the length of time. Uh, and, and the other good thing is there are no moving parts, it's modular, it's scalable, and it can be sort of grid independent or grid independent. So again, again, this is an example where the use of silicon um, has, has led to a fundamental shift in the way people look at electricity, right? So silicon as the same silicon say, used as a semiconductor, used as a substrate, uh, use of material science to process it, to deposit layers, to pattern it and to do metallization. Uh, so this question on the whole recycling, so people that did install the solar cell 25, 30 years ago, mostly in US and Japan, uh, are now thinking of uh, recycling it and the chemistries and the processes are developed so that the, the aluminum and silver that's used uh, can be reclaimed. But uh, in India, we are several decades away from that requirement right now. If you can uh, go to the next slide. I am going to change the theme a little bit. So we, again, you know, just to recap, we covered on um, you know, gadgets, we covered about high-tech products, we covered about nanotechnology and materials. Uh, we covered two examples, so two case studies. One is in the integrated circuit space and the other is on renewable energy. Now I'm going to talk about what does it take to commercialize and to make it. Now again, you know, th there are parallels here to other industries. Um, if you look at, say, automobiles as an example, there were a lot of car manufacturers maybe 30, 40, 50 years ago. And now it has really, really uh, shrunk to maybe 10, maybe 15 across the globe. Uh, we see the same thing happening in semiconductors. So two or three parameters or factors affecting that. First is it, it is becoming um, volume and scalability because the, the profit, uh, the investment requirements are increasing and the profitability also increases if you are in all segments of the value chain, uh, right from making uh, substrates or silicon, uh, this, there is a term called IDM, integrated device manufacturers. And you will see um, in the next slide who those are and how large corporations there are. So if you see this, again, as I mentioned, uh, there is consolidation. Now these logos that I have here, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Intel or Samsung or Micron. Uh, TSMC is what we call as a foundry, and it stands for Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation. Um, we at Applied Materials develop and sell equipment to these companies, so they are our customers. The names at the bottom, um, you, must, you may or may not have heard of SK Hynix, which is a Korean chip manufacturer. 
or Toshiba, which is now known as Kyokushia. But these are all the companies which have survived. A lot of others have just went into oblivion because they couldn't compete as the dimension shrunk and the investment, the capex right, they required went into billions. So this is on the semiconductor for integrated circuits, whether it's for communication or memory application. Um, on the solar side, uh, it's a little different because for a semiconductor used in devices and gadgets and high-tech products, people are willing to pay money. The challenge with solar electricity or photovoltaic electricity is the end product is still electrons. And electrons can be generated from hydroelectric plants or from burning coal or from a variety of other ways. So people's appetite to pay money for solar electricity has not changed. They still want the same uh, units per uh, rupees per unit pricing. And as a result, what has happened is there is no profitable growth across the whole solar value chain. Companies have come, companies have attempted to be profitable, and companies have survived or they have reduced their capex. Where there is money is in solar farm and in downstream application. So that's one area which is different between uh, semiconductors used in high-tech products and semiconductors used in renewable energy. And I'll give you one example in the next slide which shows you know, how much investment is required. This is very, very sort of like hot off the press. This announcement was just made yesterday. So if you see this, um, you will see what, what it takes to form the latest and greatest manufacturing facility for semiconductor. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, so this announcement just came, uh, as I said, yesterday. So this is, this is a company, a Taiwan-based company, TSMC, um, which is going to set up the manufacturing facility in Arizona and US. And what I've highlighted here is the text of interest. So if you see here, the first number to remember is a $12 billion chip fabrication plant. Okay, that's 1 billion is about 7,500 crores. So you can do the math. Uh, number one, number two, they are going to use this fab or fabrication facility to make five nanometer manufacturing technology. We looked at the transistors and how they are shrinking. So TSMC is, in my estimation, am I from based on what I know, is the first one that's going to be setting up a five nanometer on volume scale. They've also done come out and say that this facility will build uh, 20,000 silicon wafers per month or equivalent devices. And as I said, each wafer has up to 400, 500 dyes or chips. So this is, this is serious volume. Number one. Number two, uh, if you see in the second or third paragraph, TSMC is a massive contract manufacturer for numerous fabulous chip makers, such as uh, Apple, AMD, Qualcomm, and others. Okay. So TS, earlier, people used to send their uh, chip design to a foundry like TSMC and they would make it in Taiwan and ship the chips back. But now they are coming closer to where the fabulous companies are. I mean, Intel is not fabulous, but, but some of the other companies like Qualcomm and others are, are examples of fabulous. Okay. Uh, the, what, the fourth paragraph, what it says here is, having commenced risk production for five nanometer manufacturing technology, it will reportedly use that process to build Apple's next generation A14 chip. So if you just thought that A13 chip and the iPhone 11 just came, think again. Because when they launch uh, iPhone 11, uh, the technologists and scientists and engineers at Apple are already working on A14. They probably have the design done now and they are working with TSMC or another contract manufacturers to productize this and to, to commercialize this. And then the last uh, highlighted item is the construction will commence in 2021 with production target and to start in 2024. So again, that's your three-year three timeline where it takes for you to set up a greenfield fab and, and, and then to, to get it into a phase where it's producing 20,000 wafers per month. Okay. So two or three key takeaways here is um, our customers, applied materials customers are already planning they have begin risk production of five nanometer manufacturing. So as I said, five nanometer is 15, five zero, 50 angstrom, which is about 16 atom thick. And this is going to mass production in the next couple of years. Uh, they, they, the linkage is very strong between manufacturer like TSMC and their customer, which is your Apple, and their supplier, which is applied materials. Okay, and, and this is what keeps this whole 
product engine going, right? Every two to three years, there's a refresh cycle. Every two to three years, there are some new features. And almost every year or almost every week, people are uploading more images and data and, and, and doing more computation. So until that continues, um, this, this technology advances and now going beyond five nanometer to three and maybe two nanometer is, is the way ahead. Uh, for this industry and, and all the products that are supported by this industry. So if you can go to the next slide, this is probably you know, my last few slides. So we talked about all this, but what can India do in this? Now India has only one, um, we call it FAB, which is in uh, Chandigarh, which is owned by the government of India, which is the semiconductor, which used to be the SCL, Semiconductor Complex Limited. And they do um, develop chips mainly for uh, space program, ISRO, and, and also some of our advanced uh, chips required for other applications by government of India. But they are not even close to 20,000 wafer stars per month. Uh, they are talking maybe a few hundred wafers a month. So what can India do? So I have my thoughts on what areas India can do uh, to enable this use of material science and, and, and productization of high tech. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So this has, you know, these are some thoughts on what India can do to advance high-tech products, to advance uh, materials, and to truly go from an IT country or a software country. We are moving into product design. So in Bangalore and other places, you know, almost all the chip uh, companies, whether it is Intel or Samsung uh, or even global foundries, they do our Qualcomm, they have their design house, so they are uh, building some serious capabilities in that. IT we did uh, maybe a couple of decades ago, IT and software were done. Uh, so as we move closer and closer to product design, mainly in the semiconductor area, it kind of behoves us to think of next, right? What, what is next? We need to be moving up on this value chain. And one of the ways we can do this is thinking both sort of tactical as well as long-term or strategic. Right now, I, and I can confidently say that 100% of the Chips that are used in India, the, the integrated circuits are imported because nobody makes it. Uh, the demand increases, the supply is zero or close to zero. And so what, what we need to do in India is not necessarily copy them or not necessarily invest $10 billion and have, a, have the latest and greatest fab. What we need is a combination of technical investments, uh, start maybe at the back end and packaging. And in the meantime, do enough cutting edge research, right? And, and that cutting edge research will come when we have collaboration between industry, R&D lab, and academia. So in this context, I can do maybe a 30 second plug and say that you know, my employer applied materials is working with IIT Bombay in this area, right? And, and, and Professor Ganguly and Professor Loda and even previously Professor Vasi were very helpful in, in the guiding us and helping us focus and prioritize. So this, this three-way collaboration between industry, R&D labs, and academia is the way to go. Um, we have to take kind of measured steps and we have to be smart in where we invest. Maybe one area we can start with is simulation and an analysis driven materials development. So on the technical side, uh, we can use our knowledge of materials to predict and improve on yield. This a yield is how many good chips you get on a wafer. Uh, we can use algorithms and we can use learnings based on maths and material science to predict how many good dyes will come out. And that's a tremendous value to TSMCs and Intels of the world. And at the long term, we need to think, you know, what's our national policy on materials for critical infrastructure and security? Uh, you can always get a, get a bunch of hardware from Huawei or everywhere else. Uh, and there are enough uh, players in this area. Uh, but we need to think what, what's in it for us. We need to think, is this a part of our national infrastructure and is this critical for our security? So I will leave it at that. Uh, something to think about in terms of having a national policy on materials, something to think about how can we have this three-way collaboration and then how can we be tactical as well as thinking long-term strategic wins. So this was uh, my kind of concluding thoughts on what it will take to have high-tech product development and what role material science will play in that. Uh, next slide is my concluding slide. And again, as I said, you know, I, I don't want to use too many words, but what are the three key takeaways? Uh, 
one we learned that in last hour or so that material science is an enabler it's an unseen enabler but it does play a role in manufacturing chips investment in materials is required in india because it's a part of strategic infrastructure and it can also be a national security imperative and we need to go beyond it software and product design and at least in my mind and my colleague mind this is sort of the missing link for india to be a powerhouse in in how how we, how we can lead material through materials and enable differentiated high tech products it's not going to be easy it will involve multidisciplinary collaboration across various segments and it's going to take at least 10 years i know several iits and drdo labs are working on it uh, but it will take 10 more years of focused collaboration to be world leading uh, to have world leading competencies in material science so i will end it with that uh, my next slide is again thanking you so you know i've been sharing this with you for almost an hour so thanks for this opportunity thanks for spending your saturday with me and if you would like to get in touch with me this is uh, email phone and my linkedin profile thank you hey koshik so thanks a lot for uh, the really um exciting discussion uh, so there are some questions and i think you know the there are lots of questions in fact and uh, clearly uh, this is because the talk has sort of found uh, sort of some resonance so one of the questions is that you know there is moore's law which yes. has given semiconductors right mm -hmm. and uh, that's put uh, you know more memory faster processors in everybody's yeah. house and everybody's phones right mm -hmm. but uh, there is this whole um sort of fear that moore's laws coming to an end so what next is the question and you know would electronics still be important or do you think that it's not going to uh it's gone going to fizz out right so uh, i would le let let uh, you know you sort of you know present your thoughts on that sure so i think within you are probably ideally you are better qualified than me because i am just an equipment guy i am you know i am the user of this but to, i i'll give you from the user perspective and then you maybe you, know, you should add from the science perspective so from the user perspective you know as i mentioned 5 nanometer uh, is is going to be coming online in next 2 to 3 years so i think there is still lot so at the top level there is still lot of uh, mileage left in moore's law number one uh, our customers the tsmcs and samsungs of the world are already uh, having process flows for 3 nanometer so from 5 to 3 itself the other thing that has happened in moore's law is it's not going to end but it's going to slow down it takes going to be some plateau but i i believe just the silicon based semiconductor and the creativity of packaging doing 3d structures using materials and technologies like uh, selective etch and atomic layer deposition this industry will survive this industry will give us the high tech products uh, for at least next i would say 10 15 maybe even 20 years right so i i don't have that as a concern uh, what's next i think udayan is better qualified but from what i know people are already talking about carbon based uh, semiconductors people are talking about compound semiconductors and then the the latest uh, is is this whole quantum computing so i will let udayan elaborate but from a from a manufacturing uh, or or mass adoption or commercialization point of view moore's law is going to be with us for at least 15 to 20 years Then your thoughts, please. Oh, uh, you know, I think Koshik, you've actually sort of presented a fairly robust perspective, right? That um, you know there is a roadmap, yes, right? mm -hmm. and the roadmap has a materials position based on logic, yeah. right? So if you want yeah. to look at microprocessors, uh, there is a path, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in memory, uh, so. moore's law is an economic uh, or 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 a sort of historical rule right and it's 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 yeah. uh, pushed by also um, requirement right so everybody has this uh, sort of unquenchable thirst for computing and memory more memory mm -hmm. than computing probably yes yeah uh, so in that sense you know people are already saying that look i don't need to make my devices smaller Mm -hmm. i can go 3d right yeah. and mm -hmm. which is what you are showing so i can keep making things more complex and and still pack 
more functions yeah in the same space mm-hmm. so um, one of the things that i think uh, maybe needs to be added is ai yeah so, so um, while quantum computing is technically a very important idea the proof that it works has still a lot of science to be done uh, right in ai the algorithms are uh, developed and they work on existing processors mm-hmm. but you need a server farm to do ai right 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 but if you look at the original inspiration of the ai which is your brain <laughs> uh, it it works on a cup of tea right <laughs> and is it's like you know it's portable so if you look at the computing sort of benchmark that we have to go to it exists and it's a million times better than what today chips can provide yeah. mm-hmm. so there is a lot to be done on various aspects of adding sensors adding actuators adding different kinds of fuzzy computing right mm-hmm. uh, which today is not necessarily things that are touched up on by standard processors so right. i think that will be very interesting to sort of see and uh, you know things actually will actually a, sort of uh, moore's law provides some sort of a guarantee that you know if you just scale things get better but now right. there'll be a much more multifaceted development in materials algorithms circuits and so on and so forth right which yeah. cannot be written down but that doesn't mean that it won't happen right right right, right. yeah so I, i if i can just add one thing to what uday and said right it, we it, it, the general term for this is what we call as more than mook right so it doesn't necessarily have to shrink to 5 or 3 nanometer there's a whole host of application as uday and said this whole iot internet of things that would need your chips that would need your devices which are not latest and greatest second is this whole uh, chips required for communication third is auto so automobile right and transportation i mean cars are going to be the next smartphone in terms of semiconductor usage these the sensors galore maybe 30 40% of car is going to be based on semiconductor or silicon based fourth application is power so there is already talk of silicon nitride uh, silicon carbide and gallium nitride based uh, high power uh, high temperature chips which are required and the last is sensors so sensors are again uh, all pervasive there's going to be sensors everywhere and that will keep this whole semiconductor industry and the need to manufacture affordable uh, scalable and and profitable for the com- companies that are doing this so even if moore's law may be plateauing out this other applications which no necessarily need the latest and greatest will keep the semiconductor industry going way beyond the next two decades i'm sure of that materials may change but the need for technology and the need for material science will remain before quantum success right right in in fact you know i i just got a comment uh, from professor bishra to uh, uh, comment about what is happening in iit bombay so iit bombay like every other iit so there are lots of things are happening um one of the things that my group works on is um, that we are working on making neurons and synapses out of silicon Mm-hmm. so uh now this is something that is really close to manufacturing and mm-hmm. it also enables a completely different way of computing mm-hmm. so so um and we also have a lab which is able to do this which is where what koshik was talking about where we have this collaboration with applied materials so uh that that's my sort of short uh pitch for you know I, things interesting things happening at IIT Bombay uh, at least one of them there are lots lots of others so uh, i'll segue into another comment and i think you talked you, you talked about it so india has a lot of fabless companies right yes mm-hmm. and that is a huge strength right we are definitely producing about 30% of the design content uh, a fab or manufacturing and technology development um be it solar be it uh, you know standard uh, logic memory that's where you have also pointed out is a weakness right mm-hmm. um what do you think of um the hopes of having 
uh, fabs work in India? Do you think it will be economically viable? Do you think we have time to catch up? Uh, because, you know, we are already at five nanometer nodes. So sort of from the previous question, you know, we are pretty much, uh, you know, close to, you know, some very cutting edge technology, lots of investment. Should we invest there in the highest, the most, the bleeding edge of technology? Uh, so what would be your India sense, right? And you also talked about sort of the government position on things. So uh, maybe that would be good for us to sort of, you know, have a more detailed discussion before we end. Yeah, so my, you know, my views on this is, there's no point just having one fab. I mean, if you look at Taiwan or if you look at China or any other country, it's a whole ecosystem. Having, even if you want to invest $10 billion in one fab, it's just not scalable. And it may not be profitable given where the rest of the world is. So India should be India should be kind of doing its own semiconductors, but we have to be smart and we have to see where do we want to invest. For example, you know, SCL in Chandigarh is doing what's needed for uh, for ISRO, and it's it's doing its needed for uh, government of India for other applications. Right? We yeah. can have clusters like that where. We don't necessarily need to be importing. We, we do bits and pieces which are enough for our needs. And, and we don't need to be at the bleeding edge all the time. I, I don't see why we can't be working on trading edge or not necessarily your logic or memory, but some of these more than more applications. If you, if you see, again, if, you, if I can draw a parallel from the automobile sector, right? we, we, have, we have companies making cars. Maybe they are not necessarily making engines, but there are the, the value chain for auto, the, the other industry is pharma. pharma. Pharma industry is another example where we may not be, you know, we, we have our space in generic pharma. So this is, again, th there are these parallels where we can learn and say, if given, the, given the requirements and given where we are in terms of our budget and, and, and our capacity to invest, where should it be? I, I personally don't believe having one ten billion dollar fab is going to solve. India's need for semiconductors. My personal view is we start with uh, computation and, and you know we be smart in design, as you said, build on our design competency, start small, maybe have a pilot line, not necessarily of seven or five nanometer, and take that learning and iterate and then have have entrepreneurs set up a profitable venture. I mean, I can give you examples from solar, my seven years in solar where several companies tried to make Cells and, and it did not go because they just couldn't compete on a global scale. Right, right. So in fact, uh, you know, I think this is a very interesting sort of point. Um, India has had a policy on electronics from 2011. That was, the, I think, maybe the second policy on electronics. Um, and, and this year, I think they, they sort of re, re, revised it mm -hmm. in 2019. And came up with us with a, with the the next version of it, and India has been playing toying with a fab or with the idea of getting fabs, right? And we have all sort of you know pitched in and I've attended uh, those meetings, number of meetings. <laughs> um, yes. So um, so while uh, I think that is there, um, the cost of import is not abating right we are we are yeah. as you had pointed out right at the beginning you know every every piece of electronics that we import we, we use is imported so the cost is increasing and there have been sort of proposals to have mm -hmm. like the atomic uh, energy commission right or mm -hmm. the space commission right which, which are important commissions of india to have an electronics commission which would have mm -hmm. an independent sort of budget to mm. oversee this. Uh, in fact, a very important IIT, I, IIT alumnus and IIT professors are uh, pushing this agenda. So, um, uh, so, so that that exists. Um, so, from that perspective, you know, um, there is also this whole, you know, commercial position, right? Mm -hmm. But there's also a strategic position, right? Yeah. In that, you know, India always has a has the option of being uh, or has has can be denied technology, right? Mm -hmm. the time of yeah. So, yes. um, 
so uh, from that perspective, you know, SCL has existed, right? And there are also some other fabs like, you know, Sitar and yeah, mm -hmm. um, So, uh, but a bigger fab is definitely, or, you know, a few fabs mm -hmm. are, are definitely important, maybe be they analog or digital or what, do you, what have you, right? Or MEMS. Yeah. So, um, what, what do you think is sort of, you know, applied materials push on this? I mean, you know, can you talk about maybe some of those positions uh, a, a, as sure. a company? Because that would be an interesting thing for this group, because, you know, while, you know, we are talking gen general technology, there's also a lot of lobbying that we do, right? Yeah, and sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we have been, that, maybe. yeah. So we have, uh, one of my colleagues, he's actually based in uh, Delhi. Uh, and he, he's, he's head of government affairs and we are uh, doing our bit to make sure that the manufacturing uh, takes off and it survives and it thrives. But as I said, right, we, we are in one segment of this, which is the equipment and, and making it production worthy on scale. And, and, but, but there is this whole other ecosystem, uh, your whole clean rooms, your whole chemicals, your, all the other abatements everything else that has to evolve together. Just having the equipment is maybe 60, 70% of the fab, but the other, other 30, 40% needs to happen. And as, a, as an employee of applied materials, I can tell you, yes, we would be happy, willing and ready to, to participate in this venture, whether it is more than more or MAMS kind of application, or maybe let's, I mean, let's say we can even start with 65 or 45 nanometers. We don't need to start at the cutting edge. But I agree with you, we need to start we need to start at something which is of relevance to us from a infrastructure or a security point of view. And eventually we need to build on it and say, okay, how do we, how do we take it to the next level? If I again draw parallels to the automobile or the pharmaceutical and gradient industry, there are examples and there are learnings which we can apply from that industry to some economics. And I, we would be happy to discuss more on that. So, um... I mean, I think it's a good point for us to also sort of mention some interesting new developments. So, um, you know, when I came to India in 2010, we started mm. trying to lobby for a IMEC-like R&D center. Mm. Yes. And uh, so, so people who sort of uh, want to understand technology, it's an important idea in terms of, you know, how technology moves from labs in to fact. production. And um, the way it does, uh, you know, and people who are in it, like, you know, uh, uh, Koshik would sort of know this uh, very, very like the back of his hand is that it first goes from the lab to a place like an R&D center, which mocks up manufacturing yes. and tries to demonstrate lab ideas at the manufacturing scale, right? Yeah. So that you can sort of say, oh, look, there are 20 uh, lab ideas and out of that only two of them are manufacturing worthy, meaning mm -hmm. that they meet reliability specs, they meet, um, you know, production specs, they meet integration challenges. Yeah. Right, right, right. And, and with an existing baseline. It's not that technology mm -hmm. just sort of, you know, you create a new technology and it works. It has to fit into some sort of a plan of yes. the existing world. Mm -hmm. So um, in that space, uh, from 2011, we've been trying to um, do this lobbying. And um, in 2019, we have got a proposal accepted to create what is called a detailed project report uh, mm. for an R&D center. So it will be a midway between a full fab mm -hmm. and what we have in IIT Bombay and IISC and other IITs, which are sort of labs, which right. take lab level ideas and sort of, you know, vet them for manufacturing. Yes. So a report is due in the next eight months. Okay. Uh, and the questions are, you know, what sort of technologies? So for example, power electronics, mm -hmm. uh, infrastructure management of, uh, you know, high voltage switches, mm -hmm. um, you know, gallium nitride or silicon carbide for very high power antennas. Mm -hmm. right? These are not yeah. silicon, but they are very related. Yes, uh, oh, yeah. You know, uh, today there is COVID, right? So one of the things people can do is, you know, silicon-based uh, assays, 
which are, uh, you know, automated microfluidic channels, which can do, you know, with very small amounts of samples of liquids. Mm -hmm. So the question for us is, you know, how do we um, do that? And uh, there is a mandate from the government of India, which is the principal scientific advisor's office to um, create a blueprint for such an organization, right? Awesome. Yeah. And, uh, it'll be in a membership mode. So mm -hmm. companies sure. would be members and they would sort of, uh, you know, collaborate on the research pre-competitive. Mm -hmm. And then when it becomes competitive, then they take it out and do their thing. And, you know, Indian government agencies like DRDO and ISRO would also sort of benefit yeah. from it uh, by, yeah. you know, cost shared R&D. Very encouraging news. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but, you know, we still are, you know, everything will make sense once we have either manufacturing Mm -hmm. or significant amount of temp, you know, um, technology revenue, right? Through sure. materials yeah. or design, which are, which are coming out of this. So that'll yeah. be interesting. So, um, so in that, in that setup, uh, you know, what do you think, uh, you know, the, the companies which are fabless, right? Do you think that mm -hmm. they will uh, s sort of, you know, you know, how does applied material sort of, or uh, integrate with a fabless company, right? Uh, and uh, maybe uh, you can sort of comment on it, and maybe even Sushila can comment on it because she's from the from from that background. So, just wanted to leave the floor open for the couple of minutes. Sure. So, in in uh, I can I can tell you we you know, we work we work a lot with the foundries. Right? TSMC is is a very valued customer, and we continue to work with them. And TSMC in turn works very closely with the families. Uh, but there are two areas that you touched upon. First is, does it make sense for us to work with the families? And does it make sense for us to work with an EDA company? Right? Like your, your, uh, now it's a part of Siemens, but Cadence or Synopsis or one of them. I think in terms of improving the learning rate and shortening the product development cycle, it does make sense for an equipment manufacturer like applied materials to but we have to be a little bit careful because then it gets into a bit of a territorial uh, situation also. So we have to strike that balance and you know, we want to make sure that all four elements to it, which is your foundries, which is TSMC, your fabless companies, uh, the chip design houses, and the EDA companies, which, which help them design. Uh, we, should all, we should all be partnering together and making sure that the development time or the cycle is reduced because right now if you if you look at it right as you go lower and lower it takes longer and longer not only to build the chip but even to design the chip so a four-way collaboration between uh, fabless company eda company uh, foundry and equipment manufacturer will, will definitely help in accelerating the development time so uh so thanks koshik so i i also wanted to sushila to comment on this in terms of sort of the ecosystem and materials to uh, fab and then fabless, right? So maybe Sushila, you can put your comments. Okay, thanks uh, Udayan. Uh, one of the discussions that we've had in the past and we've had spent quite a bit of time today talking about the need for collaboration and uh, the need for scale and so on. And one of the uh, developments that has taken place is uh, the IIT is becoming centers that uh, are uh, setting up shared facilities that help everyone, industry, academia, research, et cetera. And uh, you know, IIT ACB, our uh, organization, also sits in a space where we can bring all of these different groups together. Uh, so for example, you mentioned fabulous uh, design, and it would be great uh, to have a shared center that uh, allows people to come in and uh, do their fab design without necessarily in, in investing in a cadence or whatever you know, software is required for it. So these are uh, great developments. And uh, personally, I'm, I'm very hopeful that we're going to see uh, a lot of excitement in the space of electronics and materials. So uh, let me take this opportunity to thank both of you for this very engaging discussion this evening. Um, you know, uh, in, in February, we had this uh, industry IIT conclave, 
and uh, several of the topics or themes that came up today were discussed there too. Uh, one of the key issues that came up for discussion that day was materials. Uh, mm -hmm. And today we have looked at electronics materials and we've gone into it in a lot of detail, starting with uh, you know, a generic discussion around why it is important. Electronics just pervades everything that we do. So it's been really fascinating to you know, kind of drill right through to the bottom to almost the atomic level and, and really understand what electronics is about. So thank you very much, uh, uh, Kaushik, for having demystified uh, uh, you know, that, that uh, magic, what you call magic, and helping us uh, understand what goes behind it. And Udayan, thank you very much. Uh, very insightful discussions. And, and I'm so thankful to both of you for having taken, uh, you know, taken this on uh, very, very uh, readily. Uh, and you know, for the audience, thank you for being here and thank you for your questions. It's all you know, helped in terms of uh, building the, the quality of this discussion, so thank you. We know we've not been able to answer every question, but uh, Kaushik has given you his email. Please feel free to reach out. Uh, and we've, today we've touched on electronics, but hopefully some talks down. We will look at materials in other, other areas as well. Uh, we do have these uh, seminars, webinars every weekend. So please do keep a lookout and we look forward to seeing you all there. So once again, thank you very much and namaste. Thank you, Sushila and Udian. Thank, thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.